received a question in regards to the notes. And so I just want to make that clarification. If you turn to page 26 of your notes, when we're going to the line of Moses. <laughs> Line of Moses. We can use the format. Yeah. yeah. We'll just deal with the end part. Um, after the third message, where judgment is revealed, we know that we have this the disappointment. The disappointment is revealed there. It's the line of Moses. But on page 26, it begins to go through the, the work, backsliding. And we know that there's a fourth message. The fourth message is repeated the second, therefore there's a first message and a second message. And we know this a third message here. And this is the this troublous times are represented here. Remember the pattern. Um, what, we, what we're doing is just changing a little bit on the notes here. We know this fourth message where the law was given on Sinai. The commandments were given 50 days after Passover. You know, this is a representation of the cross and the line of Christ 50 days after we have Passover. But what we're changing is the work Pentecost. Passover is Pentecost. What we have is the work and backside. The work that they were given to do was the reform that Moses was to bring in during the first message, Sabbath reform. And this was represented by the time where God gave them manna. Remember, manna falling from heaven in Exodus 16. There was manna that was given. They were to gather for six days. On the sixth day, they were to gather double because on the seventh there would be no manna. But we know what transpired. The Jews went out to find the manna. There was nothing there. So they didn't, they didn't fully fulfill the reform, the Sabbath reform. This backsliding led them to murmur against God as being one who was not providing for them. They were complaining about the food and the water in the wilderness. And the way that God brought the form and the conviction of sin is by causing Moses to smite the rock. And when he smote the rock, water came from it. The rock represented Christ. The water that comes from it is the Holy Spirit. It's also a representation of the blood that was shed for us on Calvary, which brought a fearful conviction of sin. And we're convicted. We're reading the story in the account. When that transpired, it, it quieted their murmuring for a time. Moses went up to the mount to receive the law of God. We read it in, in our notes. Um, that's, that's, this is one part that's not changed in, verse 20, in page 27. Page 27, B, which is righteousness being manifested. We read it said that there's never, never since man was created had there been witnessed such a manifestation of divine power as when the law was proclaimed from Sinai. So we have our uh, righteousness is manifested. It's a representation of the power of God that's there. But we know that this transpired during troubled times because while he was receiving the law in, on Sinai, what was happening in the camp? Apostasy. There was apostasy. The dancing around the golden calf. Many different things transpired. Moses comes down. Judgment is represented in him not only breaking the Ten Commandments, but we see not only a judgment, but a separation of classes as well. When Moses broke the commandments, came down before Israel, he said, in Exodus 32, who was on the Lord's side? And then we have the Levites that came, and those who had repented came on his left side, and what did the Lord tell to do? What did he tell the Levites to do? To gird your sword every man. And they went in throughout their brethren and slayed everyone who was in the apostasy. So why as you have the third, the third way mark judgment was there, we also have the separation of classes, which we see also on, on the third way mark beginning in, in, in every reformatory movement. There's a separation of classes. And so what we've changed as far as the notes is concerned, you haven't noticed just the work on page 26, the work, the backsliding, and um, the the fourth way mark. The fourth way mark beginning with the you know, beginning with the reform, we changed that. The fourth way mark itself stays the same. That's what that's Pentecost, is where they receive the law of God. And the judgment, we're not, you know, out, the way I presented it was not the judgment on Korah or Byron. It was the judgment upon those who got caught up in the apostasy. All right? So you may say the golden calf. The golden calf, the apostasy of the So that's what we didn't have in the notes. 
So there was a question of what's changed in the notes. It says you mentioned a change in the notes, but didn't continue. We did continue. We walked through it, but I didn't tell you what was changed. As you were following along with me, we didn't point and say we're taking this part out, that part out. So that's all that's changed. The way marks remain the same. It was just the characteristics of the way marks that we just changed to make it a little bit better. Because in your notes, you have the sanctification at Sinai, and the back side was the apostasy at the foot of Mount Sinai. But that came after or during the time the commandments were given. So you changed the biblical example. Yeah, the biblical example. That's all. That's all that's changed. You didn't change the biblical. Identify the biblical. Okay, okay. It's just identifying the correct characteristics in the line of Moses. Better way to put that. All right? Would you answer me if you got the it says probation is closed. I see this. Probation is closed when a door closes during the third message. What is the point of the fourth? How can you how can you then backslide and return to the old paths? Alright. My understanding of this, and feel free. Each of these reform movements typify the end of the world. Amen. When you look at the Millerite history, I can just I draw it out here. In the Millerite history, we have the first, second, third, and we have fourth angel's message. Um, within this history, in the Millerites, we know that in June. June uh, of 1842, the probation closed the part of Protestantism. Protestantism closed the doors against the message. 1843, or excuse me, 1844, you have basically the two classes developed. 43, 44, that history, the two classes have developed probation closed upon the virgins. When that history repeats, when the fourth message is given, I'm going to draw it underneath here. The reason why we have the fourth message is because that's identifying our time period. We have the Sunday law, first message. This is, is 2001. The first, this was 1840. Remember our history, 2001. We have the Sunday law, and then we have Michael standing up. At the Sunday law, whereas in 1842, Protestantism closed the door on the message. At the Sunday law, probation closed on. God's people, Adventism. So this is the only part that's kind of reversed here. But then we have Michael standing up and we have the, the general close of probation. So when we have the fourth, my understanding of the fourth waymark, and why it's there illustrated every time is because the fourth waymark is representing, you know, th this history, the fourth waymark, is the history of Adventism. The fourth waymark from the middle history. This is the fourth angel's message, which is the first second, and third angel's message. You have that history there. So you have a fourth way mark illustrated that's hypothesizing that the judgment will happen on the house of God at the end of the world. If the first angel, angels, they compile all the, all the first, it's just, it's something more clear than that. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, are you saying that the fourth angel's message is the pursuit or the three angel's message? Are we saying that the fourth angel's uh -huh. message is the first, second, and third angel's message? That's what I mean. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Is it repeat? Is it repeat? Is it repeat? Yeah. Yeah. We, have a, we have a quote that's going to get to in the material. Our sister Wright says the first and second angel's messages are still true for this time and are to run parallel with that which follows. Mm -hmm. so she, she says, what well, follows the first and second angel's message is the third. So you take the third angel's message and it is to parallel the history of the first yeah. angel. The reason why I tell you, and I, and I want to be sure of this because I come from the Comfort Church. But many thousand people from the Comfort Church are firmly believe that we seek any fourth angel's message. They don't believe in it. So I need to be clear about right. that. Right, I understand. Yeah. Be sure that people understand what I'm saying here. Right. Because we don't have to understand understanding what we're saying here is no match with the Bible. It's not. Amen. Amen. I just want to read a statement uh, Brother Kippers about our one. This is one that you have to study Bible. 
This is under Revelation 18, uh, where she says the three messages are to be combined, speaking of in the fourth. And this is manuscript 52, 1900. She says the three angels' messages are to be combined, giving their threefold light to the world. In the Revelation, John says, I saw another angel come down from heaven, and having great power, and the earth was lighted with his glory. This represents the giving of the last and threefold message of going into the world. So the fourth message is the combination of first, second, and third, which is repeated. What was the day? This is, um, this is manuscript 52, 1900. Okay, the end, well, rather than write it out, this is Michael, and then I'll put the first. I'm standing up, that's, it's a quick way of writing that. In 1844, Michael stood up and went from the holy to the most holy place, and the door closed, the ovation closed upon the virgin. Michael standing up at the end of the world is Michael coming from the most holy out, and the ovation closed. That's Daniel 12, verse 1. 12 months, the close of general, general federal human probation. I have a question, and I, you may be able to answer this as well, but let me take a shot at it first. <coughs> Can sure that I understand this question, and I may answer in a way that you're not thinking for, but on this particular subject, I have been teaching this particular subject, um, not necessarily incorrectly, but incomplete for years, and here recently, I, I've recognized my incompleteness, so I've known that there's people that may have been following what they're teaching that have have not seen the whole picture like we should. And maybe this isn't even what your question is about. But the question is, why does the separation of people occur on the second way mark in our pattern, but in the other patterns, it occurs on the third way mark? Okay. And, um, if, if I'm understanding it right, there are two separations in the Millerite history, this being the Millerite history. There's, there's a separation of the Millerites from the Protestant churches here, and then there's a separation of the, the Millerites themselves, the wise and foolish virgins here. So there's there's two separations in these in these histories. Is that like two cleansings of Gideon? Yeah, it's, that, that's right. In, in Gideon is a line that teaches two cleansings, and, and but where I've been incomplete in what I'm teaching is there's, on this subject, is there's five places where Sister White teaches that just as Christ cleansed the temple at the beginning and end of his ministry, he cleansed the temple quite, twice, she tied that in with the second and the fourth angel's message. Okay, so I've taken those passages and I've said, at the conclusion of the second angel's message in 1844, Christ cleansed the temple. And it went, the Millerite movement went from 50,000 down to 50. And then I go on and say, and he cleanses his temple a second time here at the end of the world when the wheat and tares and Adventism are separated as a Sunday law. And at that time, it's a Sunday law. It's the fourth angel's message. Both Babylon had fallen. Here's a separation. And Babylon has fallen. And this is true, but it's incomplete. I've come to understand that in another line that lines up with this, the line of Christ, you have two temple cleansings. And there, in the line of Christ, he cleanses the temple at the beginning of his ministry and at the end of his ministry. And there's two cleansings here in the Millerite history, and there's two here. So I've been I've been identifying one of the cleansings in the Millerite history, and one in the history of the 144,000, and saying that's the two cleansings that she's referring to the, the two temple cleansings. But in reality, these histories teach a two-step cleansing process, as Dave pointed out. Gideon, the story of Gideon, shows that the, the two the two reductions of people in the story of Gideon. <coughs> Sending home those that were recently married and didn't want to be involved with the fight, and then a second separation by determining how they lapped up the water. 
And in the history of Christ, there was two temple cleansings. And in the history of the Millerites, there's two cleansings. The first being the Millerites being separated from the prophet church with the second with the midnight cry. And and this, of course, is, is the same here at the end of time. Um, the latter rain begins to sprinkle in 2001 and added to the But when you get to the time of the Sunday law, when it arrives, the, pre, the wise and foolish virgins of Adventism are going to be separated. But by the time Michael stands up, the 11th hour workers will be separated out of the churches of Babylon. So there's, there's two cleansings in each of these histories. And the question was, why is the separation of the people occur on the second way mark in our pattern, but in the other patterns it occurs at the third way mark? I'd say that it, it occurs at the second and third with all of it. At least there's two cleansings in each of them. But if the word is first and then you take it according to God's yeah. churches. Now, the, so he's bringing out the, the observation here. Why is it that first the church at large is it's separated in 1842, and then God's people separated second. And here at the end of the world, God's people are first separated, and then God's people outside of Adventism are separated. And you can you can show this from a, a chiastic structure. If you, it's better if I have my notes to do this because I. I got, yeah, I got really beat up with this one, so I don't carry the notes with me. Uh, but you can show this. It, 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 I know there's some of you that have been through this, so we'll just walk this out. This is question and answering answers here, so you help me with, with this. You can track the events that lead to the Millerite history right down to the third angel's message in 1844. So let's put that here. And it's been a long time since I did this. But if you go back, when was the, the, um, the Lisbon Portugal earthquake? 1755. Uh, the dark day. 1780. No, 1780. I want to make sure I get these in order because it really has been a long time. In 1798, the papacy said to whom? Who was do I want the falling of the stars? I'm not so sure I want the falling of the stars. That's the parts I don't remember. Um, but in any case, okay, I'm not going to put any more in there because I know how to illustrate these. There's a couple more events that lead to 1844, all right? And in 1844, you have the, the Millerites, you have the virgins separated. And, and what you find is when you come down to here, to the Sunday Law at the end, that where the virgins are once again separated, where this focal point, the center point of this history is repeated at the end of the world. Then you will find that you have the fall of Babylon, which parallels 1798. Uh, and then you have, yeah, the prophetic mirror. Then you have the, the earthquake of the seven last... No, no. The earthquake of seven... Seven, the earthquake follows that. And this was the dark day. You have the darkness that follows. In the seven last plagues, you will see these histories um, illustrated in reverse order. Okay, so what you find with this prophetic mirror, and I really need to look at my notes to, to identify it, is what the theologians call a chiastic structure. All right, and the, the center of this chiastic structure is October 22nd, 1844, where the virgins of the Millerites are separated. But when the process is repeated at the end, it is reversed. In 1842, the Protestant churches were closed, and when it's repeated, first the Millerites of the 140, the wise and foolish virgins of the 144,000 history are judged and tested, and then the 11th hour workers are, and it, it reverses out that way. Um, this is all on the uh, 04 prophecy school. <laughs> Okay. Well, on the 04 prophecy school. And, and based upon that, I made some conclusions about the seven trumpets 
that I don't deal with anymore. So I, you know, I just they're, they're, I can still go back in and teach them, but I'm not so sure how bad they are. So Jeff, that's one prophetic study I got to help with. I don't know if it helps you or not, but uh, there are two of other events in Millerite history that may help you see that well, you, may, you may not be able to answer today, but I'll see you go over this tomorrow, but this is a little heads up. How, how, when is it? This will be of any help or might confuse you, but I was going to explain something tomorrow. In Millerite history, there's two midnight cries. Two. In the, in the first midnight cry, when the churches closed their door in 1842, I don't think I need to write anything. When the churches closed their door in 1842, uh, Miller had begun to cry back here in 1831. He's first a sermon in August of that year, I believe, if I'm correct. And as his uh, work began to progress, here we have the fall of the Ottoman Empire. And in between, the, uh, on this chart, you have 1837 as a date. Right here, this is, this is 1837. This says, Fear God and be glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. This is the first test that the Protestant churches failed. They failed the first angel's message. And it was given under the first midnight cry. That's why we need to understand Advent history better than we do. Because it helps us to see these prophetic patterns. And when they failed this first test, they were tested again here on time. And they failed that test because they failed the other test. And they, God sends these churches twice during the Noah right history. Both based on the Bethlehem. What historic event? Because history fulfills prophecy. What historic event took place in 1837? The answer to that is this. It's not. It, it is not. This date is not based upon any prophetic time length on the on the chart. But all the Millerites knew that they had a depression, a, a monetary collapse, took place in 1837, and under uh, Monroe, the Monroe Doctrine began to fail, to manifest destiny that they could have prosperity until they conquered the to the clear of the West. That collapsed. And under that, uh, Miller's message began to take hold. And in 1838, that's why we need to understand this history. In 1838, a year later, Josiah Litch would predict the fall of the Ottoman Empire under these economic conditions. Does it sound familiar? Yeah. Is it, is it just like where we're standing at the end of the world? Yeah. That was a historical event, but it was a prophetic event. Litch's was. But the date 1837 was not a prophetic date. It was just a date in history that they noticed that that's when the Millerite movement began to pick up speed, going on. To a and tomorrow I'll explain what the first midnight cry was in comparison with the second midnight cry, so you can get an understanding of how Miller saw things. And as we begin to see those differences, we begin to understand right what it means to be a Sabbatarian the Seventh Day Advent. Okay, um, I'm going to explain one more. Are we at the second time? We have to it too. Go ahead. I'll explain one. <laughs> could, could you expound on the Pope's latest visit in the coming National Sunday Law? And what are the way marks to look for? And the second part of the question is added on after I answered this question. And I answered this question directly to the person that wrote it this way. And I told her, I said, my wife and I have often talked about the, the, the things in prophecy that we've come to recognize we do as being providential. And there's, and there's times where, where we were being led into looking at current events and we're consumed with current events, and in those time periods, that's what we were teaching with the current events. And then there's other times when we were drawn into just things that are unfolding in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And it, what has went on here recently in terms of the Pope visiting and the secret meetings that many Adventists have been talking about, we weren't in the current event mode, so I really don't have a, a great deal of insight on that. But I went on to tell her that I am convinced uh, that in Adventism today, that one of the the most significant 
influences that's preventing black people from getting prepared are the men that are the newspaper prophets, and I'm using that term that's coined by another person that fits very well, the, the people in Adventism that have the ability to get up in front of the Adventists and use our understanding of end-time events along with the current events to stimulate and excite the crowd, and usually to promote their ministry. But I'm convinced from my prophetic study that what we have to be understanding now is the increase of knowledge that's coming from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. It's by understanding and accepting this increase of knowledge, that's part of the sanctification process that is accomplished with 144,000. And as I look around at the men who are recently really promoting the Pope's visit and the secret meetings and whatever, most of those men I personally know, and I don't have confidence that they're true instruments of prophecy. They are newspaper prophets. And I think it's a distraction for God's people. We do not understand what the Lord is revealing about end time Bible prophecy through the Bible and the spirit of prophecy first. Then we can satisfy our um, we can satisfy our our uh, mentality as Seventh Day Adventists that we are keeping up with uh, the approach in Sunday law and not really being being um, empowered by the true unfolding events. We have to be following the increase of knowledge that He's bringing out through His Word. That is not to say that every time the Pope comes and visits the United States, that this is not one step closer to the National Sunday Law, and I know full well that we've been told that movement for Sunday legislation is going on in darkness. But from my experience, Seventh-day Adventists are not studying prophecy. They're not coming to grips with the deeper veins of prophecy. And we spend our time being stimulated, stimulating our curiosity with these current events is dangerous. Unless we are doing this other work. So um, I asked Brother Jamal if he had any of the current events in connection with this question, and he's, he would have to do as I did, go dig them out. And as I told the sister who wrote this question, she probably has more of the details on this than I do. Sometimes I am up on the, the recent current events. But, um, what about the question? Could you expound on the Pope's latest visit and the coming sun, National Sunday Law? And the follow-up question, well, after I told her that, is what are the waymarks to look for? And the waymarks that are to that we are to be recognizing now, from my understanding, is the role of Islam in Bible prophecy. On September 11, 2001, the third world arrived in history uh, when the Twin Towers were taken down and the latter rain began to sprinkle. And brothers and sisters, some of the Adventists, some of them think, well, maybe September 11 is some type of fulfillment of prophecy, or, or at least it's it's contributing to the environment of the Sunday Law, but that's not good enough. September 11, 2001 is a subject of prophecy. What empowered the Millerite movement in 1840 was a prophecy from one of the woe trumpets in Revelation. It was a prophecy, a fulfillment of the sixth trumpet, which the pioneers identified as Islam. For us to be saying that the prophecy that is designed to empower the 144,000 in the latter reign is the third woe and it's Islam is an identical parallel to what empowered the Millerites in 1840. And if this is true, we must understand this because it is the sign that Christ points out in Luke 21. And to misunderstand the sign is to die. How do you know for sure that it is not that uh, for a, a lot of reasons, and I know that when you I know that when you bring this subject up, believe me, I know when you bring this subject up that the response in Adventism is, "Come on, brother Jeff, you know that it was the CIA and the Jesuits and George Bush that brought down the Twin Towers on 9/11." Don't you understand that? And and I have several responses to that, but the first one is is. Yes, I, I don't have a problem with identifying a part that the CIA or the globalists or George Bush played in it because the third woe, which is the seventh trumpet, is identified by the first two woes. The three woes are a triple application of prophecy. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with triple applications of prophecy. We have that with you here this week. But triple applications of prophecy that are identified in the Bible function like this. The first two fulfillments of prophecy identify the characteristics of the third. 
the testimony of two if things established. The charge, the charge. Sure. Yeah, if you if you follow the pioneer understanding of the fifth and sixth trumpet, they are right here. This is the fifth trumpet, it's the first blow, this is the sixth trumpet, it's the second blow. The pioneer understanding is that the fifth blow, the fifth trumpet, the first blow, was Islam bringing warfare against the armies of Rome. And in chapter 9 of Revelation, when it describes this, it's, it identifies that their warfare was accomplished by striking suddenly and unexpectedly against the armies of Rome. They were going to hurt the armies of Rome, and this was the Islam of Arabia. Whereas, the second woe was the Islam of Turkey, and they also were going to bring warfare against the armies of Rome. They were also, their mode of warfare was to strike suddenly and unexpectedly. But in this history, for the first time in the history of the world, explosives were used in warfare when Islam, in 1453, used gunpowder for the very first time to blow down the walls of Constantinople as they defeated Eastern Rome. The point is, if you maintain the pioneer understanding of the trumpet, and therefore the woes, the first woe and the second woe identify the characteristics of the third woe. When you combine them together, it is saying the third woe will be Islam, not just Islam of Arabia and Turkey, but combined, it will be worldwide Islam that attacks the armies of Rome, and as Seventh-day Adventists, we know that at the end of the world, the armies of Rome is the United States, and when they attack the armies of Rome, they will strike suddenly and unexpectedly with explosives. And on September 11, 2001, all those men that were in those planes were Muslims, even if they were motivated by the globalists. But in the second book, in Revelation 11, verse 14, it says, The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe cometh quickly. So even though the first woe is Islam, and the second woe is Islam. The second woe is not marked in inspiration as concluding until after the history of the French Revolution is portrayed. And the trumpets, according to the pioneers, are the historical forces that bring down Rome. All right? The first four trumpets brought down Western Rome by 476. By 476, pagan Rome, Western Rome is divided into ten countries. That was accomplished by the first four trumpets. The trumpets are the powers that bring down Rome. The fifth and sixth trumpet, in this trumpet, Eastern Rome is brought to a conclusion in 1453, but in this history, Papal Rome also receives a deadly wound in 1798. But this history is not concluded until verse 14 of Revelation 11. So this history of the Second World includes the French Revolution. And the French were the ones that delivered the deadly wound to the papacy, and the French are one of the ten nations of pagan Rome. They are a dragon power. Therefore, in one of the components of the second world includes France, the dragon power. And the dragon power at the end of the world is the globalists, the CIA, the Jesuits. So to use a triple application of prophecy, the third world will be identified by a combination of the first and the second world, it will be Islam striking suddenly and unexpectedly against the armies of Rome, as they did on September 11, 2001. But if the information that you've looked at leads you to conclude that that was primarily the globalists that accomplished that work, so be it. The dragon power is part of the second woe, because Revelation 11 is part of the second woe. Well, you know, we understand that Islam and Catholicism are inconsistent. I don't understand that. See, that, that is a, a teaching that is incorporated into Adventism from the Protestant world. That is the Protestant definition of Islam, brothers and sisters, and I know that there are very many famous names in Adventism that teach that, that Muhammad married a Catholic wife, and it was the purpose of getting Jerusalem for Catholicism. But, Sister White says that this chart here was directed by the hand of the Lord, and it should not be altered. She says that she saw that God was in the publishment of this chart, and that there's a prophecy of this chart in the Bible. And if it's good enough for one, it's good enough for another. And there are seven direct quotes where she says the truths that are represented on this chart are the foundational truths of Adventism. So we have, when you include her, her identification of the work of Josiah Litch, in identifying this, we have ten specific references where Sister White is putting her seal of approval on the pioneer understanding of the trumpets. And the pioneer understanding of the trumpets is that Islam is one of the historical forces that was raised up by God to bring down Rome. The pioneers do not treat Islam as a sister or a co-partner with Rome. They teach it as a providential force 
that brings down wrong, and to take that old Protestant position that is taught throughout Adventism today is to deny the foundations of Adventism. Yeah. And I know that's a shocker, but it's the facts. Well, why, they worship, why do they worship the same? Why do they call them the same baby? Why do they, they have so much common ground with people? Because they both come from the bottomless pit. <laughs> There are three powers. There are three powers in Bible prophecy that come from the bottomless pit. The first is atheism, or not the first, but atheism is marked in Revelation 11 as coming from the bottomless pit. Islam is marked as coming from the bottomless pit through Revelation chapter 9. And Catholicism is marked as coming from the bottomless pit through Revelation 17. There are similarities. So they're all, so they're all basically representing the same thing. Yeah, they're, all, they're all representing manifestations of satanic power, but they are defined as, as serving specific purposes in prophecy. And what I'm saying to you is that, that in the, maintaining the, the pioneer understanding of the role of Islam in Revelation 9 is not as a co-partner of the papacy. It is the providential force that brings the papacy down. And that's, that's, a, those, that's like oil and water. They don't mix. It serves a different role, a different purpose. It's identified and fulfilling a specific role in prophecy, but definitely it is a tool of Satan. It's a tool of Satan, and no doubt about it. But it doesn't. The way it's portrayed most often in Adventism is the Protestant system. If you look at history, when you look at Egypt, Isis, Horus, and Zeph, when you look at the Babylonian Trinity, when you look at the Persian Trinity, their cousins in their uh, uh, spiritual mystic worship, but they were also enemies. Mm -hmm. And so, as we look at uh, how these different powers of our day actually come from these inferior positions, they may have a relationship with cousins, but they do serve certain purposes. What? War against God's people. The issue is two desolating powers on this chart, those that mature into the desolating powers of our day. Warring against God's people. Well, well, but that, you, you sparked something. Maybe, maybe this will help. That you, we all know that the Catholic Church is going to persecute God's people. Right? But if you look closely at the history of Islam, it teaches us that somehow, some way, Islam in the third world is going to protect God's people. Like they did in, like they did in the first, like they did in the first world. Like like yeah. It, so. Okay, not prophetic, but a a atheism is the dragon power. No, but I'm talking about communist countries that basically are atheists and do not believe in God. They have protected God's people. Yeah, but I, I, I'm agreeing that, that we, can, we can show where Islam, atheism, Catholicism all persecute God's people. What I'm talking about is what is revealed in prophecy about these powers. And what is revealed in prophecy about the dragon power is even the persecution of the beast, the papacy, that took place in the Dark Ages, and even the persecution of the papacy at the end of the world, the tool that it uses to accomplish the persecution is the dragon power. It was the kings of Europe that actually did the dirty work for the papacy in the persecution. It's the ten kings that bring war against the lamb in Revelation 17. They're doing the dirty work of the papacy. The papacy is a persecuting power. The ten kings, the dragon power, is a persecuting power. And the false prophet's going to be a persecuting power. But Islam has been illustrated as pro providing an umbrella of protection for God's people during this time. How come? How come? In Revelation 9, verse 4, there's a command given to Islam that says, Hurt not those that have the seal of God. And the pioneer understanding, you can find it in uh, Wilkerson's book, um, Triumph. 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 and other sources is that one of the first generals after Muhammad named Abu Bakr actually gave a command to his um, warriors that when they went out he would find two classes of Christians uh, and basically it boiled up oil down to there would be a class of Christians that kept Sunday and these were the Catholic Christians and when you met them you made them bow down and accept Muhammad or you cut their head off but you would also find a class of Christians that kept the Sabbath, and you were to leave them alone. So when you use a triple application of prophecy, 
The first two woes give you the characteristics of the third and final woe. And we know that in the first woe, there was a, a, the Islam was used to provide some type of protection for God's people. As Kathy pointed out, when you go back to the father of Islam, Ishmael, and you, and you follow his descendants throughout history, you'll find that not only did they bring judgment against Israel, they provided protection for Israel. They were a double-edged sword. That, that's why Balaam is associated with the children of the east. Balaam is a type of Islam at the end of the world. And Balaam was hired to curse Israel, but he could only bless Israel. The double-edged sword. When, when Joseph's brothers were going to kill him, it was the Ishmaelite traitors, descendants of Ishmael, that carried him, protected him to Egypt. When um, Herod was going to kill Christ, it was the, the wise men from the east, the descendants of Ishmael, that provided the finances to Joseph and Mary to flee to Egypt, to, that gave him protection. It was Islam in, the, in, the, in this time period here that wrapped itself around Europe and prevented Catholicism from spreading around the world. It was the universities in Islam that preserved the received text that we get the King James Bible from. Amen. It was yeah. Islam that Martin Luther pointed to was the, the, the liver of the Protestant Reformation, because every time the Pope would send an army to snuff out the reformers, Islam would come out of the north, and the armies would have to turn and protect against Islam, and the Protestant Reformation was accomplished through the, the service of Islam. Islam is portrayed both as a protector Someone that brings judgment, but somehow, some way, Islam at the end of the world. Perhaps it's because the, they're going crazy trying to deal with Islam at the end of the world when everything's falling apart that it gives us opportunity to finish the work. But somehow, some way, it's portrayed as a protector. Um, but we need to have a word of prayer. But what do you know about Libya and Daniel 11:43 and what happened two weeks ago? Join in joining the King of the North and, and, and uh, paying off the families of the jet they killed out of Ireland or something like that 10 years ago, $2 million for the family. And they joined under, under the New World Order system. Have you heard anything about that? A little bit, but we have to have a prayer for that. <laughs> That'd be a whole other talk. <laughs> Thank you. 